Thank you so much. What a wonderful crowd there is tonight. I, you know, did Dickerson do this well? We want to find out. Um, there are three reasons I can think of that we are delighted to be here. One is that, that uh, we were told we could meet the Golden Knights great volleyball team, which everybody is talking about, even in Washington. Uh, the second reason is because I am a political junkie and I actually grew up on the other side of the state of Pennsylvania, but politics in Pennsylvania has always fascinated me. And my friend and podcast partner, James Carville, when he ran a couple campaigns here, one time described Pennsylvania as, you know, Philadelphia in the East, Pittsburgh in the West, and between Paoli and Penn Hills, it was Alabama. And <laughs> the only mistake he made was he forgot about Erie County. Because as go Erie, As goeth Erie, so goes Pennsylvania, 16, 18, 20, and 22. So I find the politics here fascinating. One of the most admirable people I have ever known in politics uh, is your former Congressman and Governor, Tom Ridge, uh, who... I have a friend, I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs, which used to be the heart of Eisenhower country and now has become very democratic. And he said, what can Republicans do to come back? I said, it's quite simple. You just find a couple of Tom Ridges and you can win elections. They, they don't seem to be following that advice. And the third reason I'm delighted to be here is because of what you have done in this community. And I wanna praise uh, what Jefferson Educational has done as a group that collects people and convenes. Uh, our friend Jim and Deb Fallows first told us about Erie. It was the, you know, the a wonderful, piece in their book, Our Towns, and the documentary they did. And the, the point they make is that for all the friction we talk about in this country, which is quite pronounced, and Judy can, will get into that, that there are communities like Erie that really try to make it work. There are challenges, there are terrific challenges. But what you have done here, and you still have challenges, is remarkable. First of all, you have, greet, you have put out the welcome mat for new Americans. Uh, not everybody does that, and it almost always strengthens a community. And you've adapted, sought to adapt economically, and I think you have a, a vibrant community with challenges. Uh, and that's pretty good. That really is pretty good these days. And I think that Jefferson has played a huge role in that. And I just commend them. I wish we could bring them to Washington, because Lord knows we need that in Washington. Um, I'm going to just give an overview of these elections that just took place because I think that is on a lot of people's minds and then we'll turn to the more substantive part uh, to Judy and then we'll be joined by our good friend and airy legend Steve Scully. Um, this was an interesting election. I think it was a surprise. It was bad news for the Republicans in the sense that it was really the worst midterm elections that an in party has had in a long time. They've only really been three uh, midterm elections before this where the challenging party did as poorly, the challenging party being the party that doesn't control the White House, did as poorly as Republicans did this year. Uh, and one of them was in 1962 when the election occurred weeks after the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a natural tendency to rally around the incumbent party, the Democrats. One of them was in 1998 when the Republicans in the House overplayed their hand and voted to impeach Bill Clinton for a, a sexual indiscretion. However much we might disapprove of that, one wonders if that's what the founders had in mind when they wrote the impeachment clause. Uh, and the other was 2002 uh, in the aftermath still of 9-11. There was none of that this time. And yeah, there was a really poor showing by the Republicans. They couldn't take over the Senate. They barely won the House. Uh, they're going to regret that almost from day one. I mean, Kevin McCarthy might make speaker. If so, he is going to have a nervous breakdown almost every day for the next uh, year. There's a saying in, 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 in football that, you know, a, a, a receiver hears, hears footsteps. If he goes out with somebody about to clobber him, Kevin McCarthy is going to hear combat boots every day because they're going to be after him from day one. So I think the Republican Party has real problems. And you look at some of the candidates they ran this year. We don't have to go further than the Keystone State uh, to see that. Uh, I, my guess is that, uh, that General Shapiro would have been a strong candidate against almost anybody, but anyone would have run better than the other guy did, uh, you know, Mastriano, and that um, 
John Fetterman overcame a lot of obstacles to win, but one of the great strengths he had was Dr. Oz. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, but Oz looks pretty good next to Herschel Walker. Uh, uh, you know, someone said the other day, you'll see Herschel Walker again. It, it, that is, if you're not one of his children. Uh, so um, the, the Republicans really had a disappointing night. And I think uh, one of the things that some, I think that their moderate conservatives hoped was that this would expunge Trumpism from the party. It did not. It is true, fortunately, that some of the most prominent election deniers, including here, lost, and that's good. Uh, but it, it's really wrong to say that the Trump faction uh, was dealt the kind of decisive defeat that would weaken them in the party. They weren't. Uh, they, his candidates won in Ohio. His candidates won in North Carolina. Uh, and uh, a lot of the people, even who weren't Trump candidates, echoed the Trump line. So Trump, Trumpism, wherever he is, uh, even if he's in an orange jumpsuit, is still going to be, be, I think, a, a force in the Republican Party. I don't think it's a good force, a constructive force, but it's going to be there. So great news for the Democrats, right? No. Uh, first of all, they don't control the House. They won't get anything done in the next two years. The Democrats, the Democrats are a party of governance. They want to do things. You can approve, you can disapprove, but they face a two years where it's going to be very hard to get anything done other than Senate confirmations. And uh, that's going to prove frustrating to them. Uh, and the Senate, they do have a 50 to 49 to whatever Kirsten Cinema is majority, uh, but they, they, they wanted to pick up more seats this time because they face a dreadful map in two years. They face a map with 23 of the 33 senators running are Democrats, and of the 10 Republicans, there are not very many who look at all vulnerable. They're all from deep red states. So this is their time to get something done, and other than judges, it's going to be very, very hard. Moreover, I think both parties, when you look at the presidential lineup for 2024, face real challenges. Joe Biden has had a really good first two years. It's been much more successful than I think most people anticipated. You can argue you have to go back to FDR to find a president that got as much done in two years. And he says he's going to run for re-election. He's going to be 82. Um, I will tell you, I am two weeks to the day younger than Joe Biden. I ain't ready to run for president. And I think age is going to be a huge, huge factor. And I don't, I think the Republican, the Fox News charge that he somehow lost it, that he's seen now, that's just utter nonsense, it's not true. But, but, you, but you get older. And I think it's something that, that worries Democrats privately a great deal. And if he should decide not to run, and as of now, he's clearly running, people say, well, who will we nominate? Well, I don't know. I mean, people would have said the same thing about Jimmy Carter, the same thing really in 2000, this time 2006, no one thought Barack Obama was gonna be the next president. So someone might emerge, but on the Republican side, you have the Trump force, which is there. And if Trump faces a multi-field candidacy, he'll win because he's got a hardcore 30, 32%. So let four or five candidates get in, Ron DeSantis and Chris Christie or uh, you know Nikki Haley, he's gonna win. And I think he's gonna be a very weak general election candidate, far weaker than he was in 2020. So I think both parties have huge problems. But to me, the most, I think there were, there were really good things out of this election. I think some, principally some bad people lost, the election deniers in particular lost. And I think that's really important for our democratic system of government. So there were some good things that occurred. I think the thing that was not so good is that America is gonna be as divided. Washington is gonna be as divisive. We're gonna keep trying to find out, uh, you know, why we are so divided, but there will be an answer to that because one of our great reporters, Judy Woodruff, for the next two years at the news hour is gonna travel around the country and find out why we're so divided and find out what we can do about it. And with that, I turn it over to Judy Woodruff.
Thank you very much, Al Hunt. We've been married 42 years. Um, every moment has been... <laughs> has been heavenly, uh, just like all of you who've been married 42 years, every moment has been heavenly. Um, as Al said, we are so thrilled and so pleased to be in Erie. What a wonderful community, what a wonderful um, uh, story you have to tell. And as Al said, what the Jefferson Educational Society is doing is the kind of thing that we wish there were in every city in America. It's the kind of thing that, um, that frankly brings out the best in all of us uh, who care about this country so much and believe in our role as citizens. Um, I'm just gonna speak very briefly because we want, both of us wanna get on to the main act and that is the incredible Erie native Steve Scully um, asking us questions that he promised that they're not gonna be too tough. Uh, we'll find out in a minute. But I just wanna say a few words about what I am gonna be doing. As some of you know, I've been anchoring the PBS NewsHour uh, in one form or another for about the past 11 years since uh, Jim Lehrer. Thank you. Thank you. And truly the great honor of my life uh, to have, have come along uh, it, both in my first uh, tour at the News Hour from the early 80s through the early 90s and then being able to come back to the News Hour in 2007 and to be able to be part of that amazing program, amazing team of journalists who um, every day I can have to pinch myself to think about uh, the extraordinary people I get to work with. But I knew the time would come when it would be the right time to step aside from the anchor desk and to turn it over to the next generation. And I know that's what uh, we, are, we will have in the new team. Amna Navaz and Jeff Bennett will be our, the next anchors. They're going to start in early January. They're going to be fantastic. You can give them a round of applause. Um, but, and, but as for me and, and why what Al said at the end of his comments are so resonant for me is that I've been thinking for some time about how divided we are as a country. And you know, we know Washington is divided. We see it every day on the news. But the question is, is this country also divided? Is what we're seeing in Washington truly and honestly reflective of who we are as a people. So what I want to do uh, from now till the next election day, which is truly the end of 2024, is travel around the country, sit down uh, with ordinary Americans, extraordinary ordinary Americans in as many places as I can get to with my uh, reporting team to talk to them about what they care about, what they worry about, what they hope for their children, and if they're young, what their hopes are for themselves for the future, and to try to understand how they see their role as citizens and how that fits into the larger picture of the country, and, and to try to understand if we are as divided as we clearly are in Washington, or is that something that's a passing phenomenon? So whatever I can do as a journalist to do that, we'll also, I'll also be talking with people who have read and, and have written and thought deeply about this subject. Uh, some politicians, yes, but primarily people who are in education, who are sociologists, psycho psychologists, people who, who studied people and study the way people interact with each other and talk to people about issues and why are we, why do we have the different views we have on immigration, uh, on housing policy, on education, the things that we never used to argue about what our children should be taught in school. That's now become a, um, a, 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 an issue that brings people to a boiling point in some communities. So that's my goal. I'm very excited. I'm gonna start this in January and we'll be bringing you regular reports every week or two on the news hour. We'll be producing hopefully some specials for PBS, having some partners in journalism. Uh, I'm very, very excited about it. Who knows, maybe I'll be back to Erie uh, to look at what you're doing in your community, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, but, um, but I'm looking for ideas, so uh, send them through Steve Scully, who I want to bring on the stage right now because he's an amazing human being and he was born and raised in Erie. <laughs> Judy Woodruff, welcome to Erie. Mr. Judy Woodruff, welcome to Erie. <laughs> oh, you need the microphone though. 
friend Robert Novak used to say when we got married, I was a chief political reporter for the Wall Street Journal. She was the White House correspondent for NBC News. And he said we both hadn't wanted to address the issue of names. It was difficult. But after consideration, Judy let me keep my maiden name. So I really do appreciate that. So what kind of a softball player was he? What kind of what? Softball player. Oh, softball. He was uh, not that impressive. I mean, his, his, <laughs> he played football in high school. That was yeah. his. <laughs> well, the, the, the story is, and it's a true story, I was covering the, the Jimmy Carter campaign mm -hmm. in the summer of 1976, as it was clear that he was going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. We were spending the bulk of that summer in Plains, Georgia, a very hot mosquito-dominated uh, summer. And the press corps following Jimmy Carter were holding at the behest of the, the nominee, uh, these regular softball games between the press and the Carter staff, which- And of course, Carter himself. And Carter himself, who pitched at his you know, direction um, and, and supplemented by the way, by secret service agents who were all bulked up and in great shape. They won every single game against the press, as you can imagine, but it was at one of these softball games on a weekend in I think July of 1976, when this big shot Wall Street Journal reporter showed up and I was playing second base and he was came out into what center field and introduced himself and he was pretty impressed with himself. <laughs> 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 but we started dating the next year and we were married three years later. Oh, congratulations. By the way, I just got a text message from John Dickerson. He said, what's the crowd like tonight? I said, it's twice as large tonight. So thank you for being the warm up act. So you can tell that to John Dickerson. Judy, I want to begin with what you were talking about because the media today, more partisan and more polarized than ever before, more money in campaigns than ever before. And when it comes to Congress, congressional districts that are gerrymandered that make it really difficult to cross the party aisle. How did we get to this point and how do we fix it? Well, I, I will tell you that what you just said is a large part of the reason that we are so divided. I am convinced that the gerrymandering that's happened that has created uh, a Congress that is farther to the left and farther to the right than ever before, the fact that most moderates in the Congress have disappeared, not all, thank goodness, you know, and they are, we still see some of them but they are clearly in the minority. And gerrymandering has had a lot to do with that. Our campaign finance system has had a lot to do with that. People, organizations give money to candidates who lean one way or another on an issue. If you're a moderate, if you're somebody who's known for compromise, you're gonna have a harder time raising money. You're gonna have a harder time probably making the leadership of your party happy. So all those forces have been at work the media has clearly, as you just said, Steve, has played an enormous role. What plays on television? Uh, debate, fight, uh, people yelling at each other. We're seeing so much of that. And opinion, the, the opinion that used to be a piece of American journalism is now the dominant part of American journalism. Everywhere you look, there's opinion. You can find it online. You can find it certainly on the radio. You can find it on cable news. Uh, all of those things have played a role. Do I have an answer for how we fix it? I don't. But what I will tell you is that and the, one of the reasons I'm embarking on this project is because I believe if there are answers, we're going to find them in the communities like yours, where people are finding ways to work together. It's not kumbaya. It's not pretending that we all agree suddenly on everything. No, that's not what I'm saying. And that's not what America's all about. In a democracy, we have different views. We debate those views but we don't consider the other side the enemy. We don't demonize the other side. And that's what I'm interested in finding out if the kind of division and demonization that we see in Washington is what American people want. Is that what they see in themselves? Um, and if, if, if not, then how do they see coming through it? So I'm going out looking for answers for the next two years. Al Hunt, you mentioned Tom Ridge, and he has often said he doesn't recognize the Republican Party that it is today. But to Judy's point, for many years, you debated the issues fiercely with partisanship, and yet you would come together at the end of the show. Let me just roll part of the Capitol Gang. Washington, the Capitol Gang. <laughs> Who's that young guy in the end?
Welcome to Capital Gang. I'm Al Hunt with Mark Shields, Robert Novak, and Margaret Warner. Our guest is Senate Republican Leader Robert Dole. Bob, it's good to have you back. Thank you very much. Russia's Congress of People's Deputies has backed away from a constitutional crisis. Oh, After a fiery debate, the parliament voted today against considering impeachment of Boris Yeltsin as Russian president. Yeltsin then made an unscheduled appearance before the Congress to oppose a pending resolution condemning him and appeal for new talks with his rivals. His survival followed repeated boosts from Washington for Yeltsin and Russian democracy. You look good there. But why did I show that? Because you would be able to have both sides at the same table. You're not going to Fox or MSNBC. They're all right there. And you and Bob Novak probably disagreed on 95% of the issues. Oh, I don't know where the 5% was. Steve. <laughs> and he was my dear friend, and I miss him every day. Uh, but we had, a, I think, a really a, a civil debate. I mean, you know, sometimes we both go overboard a bit, but um, it, and, and it was, I, I think it was substantive and uh, it worked. And it was symptomatic of a Washington of yesterday. Let me tell you two stories about Washington that could not happen today. In 1978, President Carter proposed a Panama Canals Treaty. I mean, the, the Panama Canals really belonged to the Panamanians, but we had run it for a long time and it was creating great unrest down there. And Carter proposed an orderly transfer, which was the only sensible policy, but it was political, it was politically lethal. I mean, it was opposed by 70%, 65% of the country and about 75% of Republicans. And it was a treaty, so it required a two thirds vote in the United States Senate. Democrats had a majority, but nothing like two thirds. It could not have passed without the Republican leader in the Senate, Howard Henry Baker of Tennessee. He was planning to run for president in 1980. This was gonna be a, if they put it mildly, it would not have helped his campaign. And he came out for the Panama Canal treaties because it was the right thing to do. If he hadn't have done that, it, they, they wouldn't have passed and it may have been a really created a really dangerous situation down there. That's story number one. Story number two is after the 1980 election, the great shock was not that Reagan won, but the Republicans took back the Senate for the first time in 40 years. I mean, it really was, wasn't 40, it was actually about, about 30, I guess, but it was a real, it was a real shock. And uh, the, uh, the, the Ted Kennedy was on the Judiciary Committee and he had, had, had sent up a nomination of his top staff aide to be a federal judge on the, on the circuit court up in Boston. And they couldn't get to it before the election, but they thought, well, we'll do it after the election because the Democrats will still be in control. Well, guess what? They weren't in control. Uh, so he went to Strom Thurmond, who was gonna be the incoming chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And he said, look, in the lame duck session, could you just do me a personal favor and see if we can get this guy confirmed? That's a seat the Republicans would have controlled. Mm -hmm. That was Stephen Breyer. If that hadn't have happened, Stephen Breyer never would have been on the Supreme Court. That story couldn't happen today. And that's the difference in not just journalism, but the difference in, in, in Washington. And people say, well, there were fights before, there were differences before, there was friction before. Yeah, there was. But there also could be a sense of comity and, and, and civility and decency. And the Panama Canal Treaties and Stephen Breyer are just two, two illustrations of that that I think probably are unlikely today. So as you approach the news hour, Judy, nobody has a sense one way or the other of your point of view. It is just the facts. I'm gonna play in just a moment, Jim Lehrer's rules for journalism, but you're an oasis in a very difficult media environment. That was uh, a standard set by Robert McNeil and Jim Lehrer. They had co-anchored PBS's coverage of the Watergate hearings. And they found that they worked together really, really well. And when PBS came to Robert McNeil and said, we'd like you to do a nightly half hour news program, national news program, Robin started it, but he immediately invited Jim to be his Washington sidekick, his correspondent in Washington. But right away, they realized, Robin realized that it needed to be the two of them. So it became the mcneil Lehrer Report. It went from being the Robert McNeil Report to the mcneil Lehrer. And from the get-go, what they were all about was real journalism. What we're here for is the facts. What we're here for is to go out and report, bring back the information, 
And that, that was the kind of journalism I wanted to be part of. It was what I was taught as a local reporter in Atlanta. I worked for a CBS affiliate in Atlanta for five years covering the state legislature, city hall. I was told I had one producer who very early on, because I had not studied journalism, I majored in political science. He said, you know, you're going out on the story. And he said, don't ever forget, nobody gives a damn what Judy Woodruff thinks. We want you to go out and report take notes, get all the information you can, shoot the story, come back and tell us what you learned. And we don't care what you think. And that stayed with me for the, and it has stayed with me. And that's, that's what the news hour is. It's what the news hour has always been. And if you say you're gonna show what Jim Lehrer and yeah. his principles of journalism, you'll see exactly that. We do give a damn what you think. So thank you very much. Let's go to that video clip of Jim Lehrer. Do nothing I cannot defend, cover, write, and present every story with the care I would want if the story were about me. Assume there is at least one other side or version to every story. Assume the viewer is as smart and as caring and as good a person as I am. Assume the same about all people on whom I report. Assume personal lives are a private matter until a legitimate turn in the story absolutely mandates otherwise. Carefully separate opinion and analysis from straight news stories and clearly label everything. Do not use anonymous sources or blind quotes except on rare and monumental occasions. No one should ever be allowed to attack another anonymously. And finally, I am not in the entertainment business. Al Hunt, react to that if you would. Well, let me, let me just add that certainly I, I think the news hour is the crown jewel uh, of, uh, of television, but I'll tell you who else is in that category was Steve Scully and C-SPAN because they cared about what people thought. They let people talk. They didn't express their own opinions. And so we have some problems with journalism in this country. I, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. One of the assignments I give my students is they go and they watch the evening broadcast of MSNBC and Fox. They alternate back and forth and they come back with a report and said, my God, it's not just a different take, it's a different universe. And I think that the, the Jim Lairs, the Robin McNeils, the Judy Woodruffs, and the Steve, Steve Scullys uh, have been the examples that we are fortunate to have by contrast. Well, thank you. Uh, I have we there is so much to talk about Judy Woodruff in your career, but I've I've picked two moments that I think uh, this audience would find particularly interesting. And as we look back at presidential debates, this is probably the most significant VP debate and one of the most important debates in modern history. And you had a front row seat, 1988, Senator Lloyd Benson and Senator Dan. Well, I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. I will be prepared to deal with the people in the Bush administration if that unfortunate event would ever occur. Senator Benson. Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. It has to be that. In a situation like that. In a situation please, like that. You're only taking time is to call in the joint. Your own candidate. That was really uncalled for, Senator. <laughs> The hair was a little longer. <laughs> what a moment, though. Uh, what a moment. I mean, I have to say, uh, we learned later, of course, that the Benson campaign had been preparing. He didn't know Jack Kennedy that well. <laughs> it was a great line. Don't let the facts get in the way. But well, he, knew, he knew him, but but they had heard, they knew that that Quayle was using this line on the campaign trail. And, and so uh, Benson was prepared if Quayle used it. And so you could see the look on his face just then as Quayle was saying that, but honestly, sitting there as the moderator alongside Tom Brokaw and a few other terrific journalists, we, uh, you, you would have thought that the, that the campaign was over at that moment. The room exploded. 
And, and of course, Benson had just, you know, had, had clocked uh, uh, Dan Quayle. But of course, what went on to happen, you learn that debates are not the end all and be all of campaigns, that you can have a big moment in a debate and then the campaign will work its way as it, as it went on. I mean, Benson and Dukakis lost. But Al, that was like the third or fourth time they brought up the question of Dan Quayle's experience. So this was like at some point, Lloyd Benson knew he had to go in for the kill. He did, and it also illustrates because it, I, I don't think I've ever seen a more effective moment in a debate, certainly in a presidential or vice presidential debate, and it didn't matter in the end. And it, among other things, it says there's some things that are just, you know, there, there, there are circumstances, there are conditions that are just set in, and vice presidents rarely matter. They can hurt you a little bit. They can help you slightly. Uh, Benson was clearly a stronger candidate than Senator Quayle at that time, and it didn't matter. And I think uh, in the general proposition, as a general proposition, it doesn't matter. Lyndon Johnson was the notable exception. I'm not sure that Jack Kennedy could have carried Texas or one or two other southern states without Lyndon Johnson. But that's a rarity, Steve. Judy, two months and a week or a week and a half into the Reagan presidency, you are at the Washington Hilton Hotel covering what is a very standard, the president leaving the White House, speaking before a union group, nothing really special about that day until? Until we were, we were in the room when he was speaking to a, a buildings trade, building trades group, and we went outside. I was part of the press pool that day. This is a group of reporters and camera crews who are, who are uh, essentially representing the, the rest of the press corps. And we're waiting, and it's, it's March, 31st, 1981, President Reagan comes out the door and I'm standing about 25 feet on the other side of his limousine. There was a row of cars, the press vans were behind. And I start yelling a question about Lech Walesa in Poland. Something was happening with the, uh, uh, um, the political, uh, there was a, a political upheaval in Poland. Started to get the words out of my mouth. And then we all heard this pop, pop, pop sound. And it sounded like firecrackers. But of course you realize instantly that in, there won't be firecrackers around a president. People were screaming down. And, and within seconds, what I didn't see was of course the Secret Service shoved President Reagan into his car. The motorcade took off. In an instant they said, you're either coming with us in the motorcade or you're gonna stay here and file. And I said, I'm staying here, I'm gonna file. Um, you no can argue, cell phones. No cell phones. So I'm, <laughs> what I do is, is, is I mean, this, this in my memory, it, it could have been, uh, it maybe took 10 seconds for all this to transpire, but the, the, the real in my head is looking and seeing three people on the ground, including Jim Brady, who was his newly named press secretary, someone I knew, we knew, we had just been to dinner with him just a few days before, lying on the ground, clearly badly, terribly wounded, he'd been hit, um, and digesting that and understanding that and at the same time having to go run find a telephone. I ran into the Hilton. The two uh, pay phones that I could see in the lobby were taken by other reporters. I ran across the street, found uh, a phone in a, a federal, uh, it was a federal building, it was some agency, and I screamed, I said, could I have a phone? And got to the phone and was on the air with NBC radio. But it was a reminder, I mean, for me, I was um, 30, four years old, um, I was, um, um, that at any moment, if you're a reporter covering the White House, you have to be prepared in the worst of circumstances to keep your cool, to do the job that you have to do. But at the same time, we're human. And I, the, the image that I will forever have in my mind of, is of Jim Brady. And of course he went on, he survived, he lived several more decades um, was an amazing human being, but of course he was never the same after that terrible uh, brain injury. But, um, but it, you're right, it's, it's a moment that um, is part of who I am, it's part of my history. As a I, I'm gonna give a personal addendum to that because Judy was, we just found out she was pregnant with uh, what was to be our first child, which I knew. And she told me that morning as she was leaving, I just mentioned in passing, which she always did, you know, I'm gonna be in the, the pool today. It didn't mean much of an anything. I just knew the pool meant she was gonna be right around the president. And I went up to cover the hill, and which I did back then. And then we got the reports that Reagan had been shot. 
and that there were people around him who were badly wounded. There were even reports of someone had been killed. And I knew then of the 20 people closest to the president, my wife was one of them. I didn't know where she was. I didn't know how close she was. This was before cell phones. This was before the internet. And there was no information out there. And I was frantic. And I ran in to Senator Baker's office. He was the Senate Majority Leader then. And I was in virtually, <clears throat> I was in tears. <clears throat> and I said, you know, can we find out? And he called the White House and in a couple of minutes told me that there were some people who had been hit, but it was not my wife. And that's the only way I could find out. And it just, those were different times. It was a frightening day. Wow, I had never heard that before. Um, and yet, during that dark moment, Reagan's humor was so evident, wasn't it? <laughs> Honey, I forgot to duck. And you're all Republicans, right? And we're all Republicans. I mean, he, that, and, it, and it is who Ronald Reagan was. I mean, he not only came out of Hollywood and you know, had his talent as an actor, he was somebody who did have a sense of humor and used it uh, to his benefit throughout his political, political life. Um, he was fierce in his beliefs, uh, but he also knew how to come up with a line at that moment. I mean, what, what was it when Nancy was in the room and um, at the hospital, and that was the story. And um, and he spontaneously came up with it when she first saw him. So um, I mean, those were the kinds. Those are the moments that define how we see our leaders, our our political leaders. I interviewed Jim Baker, and he tells a story about how when Reagan woke up, he saw Jim Baker, Ed Meese, and um, uh, Mike Michael Deaver. And he said, who's running the show? You're all here. <laughs> um, I have a clip of an interview that you did with Dr. Giordano, who was the emergency room doctor, just set up this interview that was 30 years after the shooting. So this was, we were doing, it was an anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, of the of the shooting and he and Dr. Giordano had had been the doctor, you know, essential uh, uh, physician who worked on President Reagan and we were doing a retrospective and talked to him about what happened. You've got the clip, right? Let's roll the tape. Uh, we had trained for four years uh, since 1976, 1980, setting up the trauma system at GW and everybody was well trained at that point in time. Uh, the president was treated like any patient. Uh, we would notify right before he got there that somebody was on the way and uh, he came in through the main door. He collapsed. Uh, he was brought back to the resuscitation area. Uh, the trauma team was there and they assessed him and treated him accordingly. So just any other patient, but it has, uh, if you go to Washington DC, it's now the Ronald Reagan Trauma Center. No question. And what, and of course, what we've learned in the interim is that Reagan came much closer to death than we realized at the time. You know, initially the White House was not, they didn't, all the information about what had happened didn't come out. Eventually it did. And we learned that the bullet was, came very close to his heart. They had to go into his lung. He was bleeding uh, uh, much more than we realized. Um, and so, um, it, and, and then, and then, the humanity of Ronald Reagan came through. And it wasn't just the honey, I forgot to duck and we're all Republicans now. It was Nancy Reagan waving, remember from the window at, at Walter Reed and those scenes. It was as if time had stopped. We had a president of the United States who had survived an assassination attempt. I mean, today, here we are in 2022 and we're still talking about what happened to John Hinckley who was released in, in, in a form of custody. Um, uh, but, um, it, it was, again, it was, a, it was almost as if time stood still after he was, the White House kept going. Uh, the, you know, the staff was busy, but everybody was waiting to see what was gonna happen to the president. Al Hunt, we talked last night with John Dickerson about the American presidency, and we talked a little bit about impeachment, which has now become much more of a political tool rather than a constitutional tool. They're already talking about impeaching Joe Biden in the next Congress, how did we get to this point? And, and, and when did we reach this point? Well, I covered the Nixon impeachment. I covered the, the uh, House Committee on Judiciary. It was such a, 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 a really a meticulously prepared, researched, well done, bipartisan 
process. It didn't happen in a matter of weeks. It happened in a matter of six or seven months. They picked the great John Doerr to be the counsel. And then they picked a Chicago lawyer, Albert Jenner, to be the Republican counsel. They worked together. And they had, I mean, they went on. It was, it was if you talk to the survivors on that committee, they will tell you it was a painful process. They hadn't impeached the president in over 100 years. This was not a good precedent at all, a precedent at all. But they finally concluded, and I think they made a very compelling case, that he had clearly committed high crimes and misdemeanors. But what they did, they set a, a record, and they, set a, they established a record, and they established a thoroughness, and they established a bipartisanship that made that, I think, a totally justifiable act. They did. I mean, in the end, more came out, and uh, you know, there were you know, probably 400 members who would have voted for an impeachment bill if it had come to the House. Uh, and I think that was the high watermark in impeachments. And I don't think, I mean, I would argue, and some would disagree, I thought the Clinton impeachment was ridiculous. Again, you know, I think what he did was horrible. He should have been censured. <coughs> but I don't think that met the def uh, definition of, <coughs> excuse me, Steve, of impeachment. I could argue either um, of, the, of the Trump impeachments, but they were hasty. And it wasn't done in that deliberative style that was done in 1973 and 74. And I had I failed to mention there was an urban committee beforehand. So I think it's a very dangerous situation to say, you know, we don't agree with someone as president, so therefore we're going to impeach him. That's what banana republics do. Well, the system worked with Watergate. The system worked. The media did its job. Right. The Republicans who said to Mr. Nixon, the gig is up. Democrats who were slow walking all of this. But that's not the case today, Judy. No, we are in a much more hair trigger uh, situation where, um, well, it's, it's what we, you started this conversation with, Steve, which is how divided Washington is and how the middle has slowly all but disappeared. We have so few people. Al and I were fortunate to spend a little bit of time in the last couple of weeks with Bill Bradley, the senator, uh, the former senator from New Jersey, great basketball player, as everybody knows. Um, he was uh, a moderate. And yet at the point came when he felt it just, he wasn't welcome. Uh, I mean, Al can weigh in on this too, because you covered him very closely in the Senate, but he felt, and this was years ago, but he felt he was no longer, there was no longer a, a, a welcoming place for him in the Democratic Party. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think it, it wasn't so much the Democratic Party, it was the institution was changing. And the institution looked so much better back then than it does today. Uh, so, you know, it's been a, unfortunately, it's been a continuing process. I mean, the other day, there were House Republicans talking about impeaching Biden. And I thought, okay, I wonder what they're going to impeach Biden for. And, and the first immigration, answer, right? immigration. Well, also, uh, uh, Brittany uh, Grenier. I mean, I mean, wh why were you going to impeach him for that? Well, because uh, it was a bad trade. Oh, it was a bad trade. I mean, what trade did you want to do? Uh, you know, who thought that Putin would be reasonable uh, and give him a better trade? And you, you might hate it. Maybe it shouldn't have happened. Maybe it encourages other hostages. That's not what you impeach someone for. But is it because she is a six foot nine African-American lesbian basketball player? Oh, Steve, how could you possibly suggest that? <laughs> Just asking the question. Yes. It was the news hour with Jim Lair and Robert McNeil, and it was the news hour with Gwen Ifill and Judy Woodruff. And I want to play just a portion. Uh, I love Gwen Ifill, and she was a trailblazer like you. And of course, in 2016, she lost what was just over a year long battle with cancer. And I just want to play part of this. What was significant is what President Obama had to say. So let's roll the tape. Our lead tonight is news that we hoped we would never have to report. Our managing editor, my co-anchor, and dear friend Gwen Eiffel died earlier today after an almost year-long battle with cancer. She was a supernova in a profession loaded with smart and talented people. So it's no surprise that messages of condolence have flooded in all afternoon from across the journalism and political spectrum. President Obama said this at the White House. Michelle and I want to offer our deepest condolences to Gwen Eiffel's family uh, and all of you, her colleagues, uh, on her passing. Uh, Gwen was a friend of ours. She was an extraordinary journalist. She always kept faith with the fundamental responsibilities of her profession, asking tough questions, 
holding people in power accountable and defending a strong and free press that makes our democracy work. And Judy, I'd ask Gwen about coming to Erie and she said, I'm coming up. So we're especially glad that you're here tonight to represent the great Gwen Eiffel, but um, her legacy too is incredible. Incredible. I mean, Gwen, you may heard just now, I mean, I called her a supernova and that's really what she was. I mean, she was someone who, daughter of a minister, um, a unlikely beginning. I mean, she went into journalism at a time when uh, women were not that welcome and black, uh, well, men and women were not welcome. She, her first job at a Boston newspaper, she found a note on her desk one day with the ugliest kind of language on it uh, as she showed up for work uh, to report for the Boston Herald. Um, and she went on to break down one barrier after another, one after another, and to be not only brilliant, uh, fearless, I mean, about as fearless a journalist as, as I can think of, and an incredible mentor. She, um, she believed so deeply in the need to bring along other young journalists behind her, especially young women and men journalists of color who were dealing with some of the same uh, obstacles, setbacks, doubts, and worse that she had dealt with. And so she, wherever Gwen was, there were, there were young people who were trying to talk to her. I was, I'd be in her office and she'd get a call or she'd get an email or somebody would want to see her. Um, she was just, you know, not only one of the best of the, of the journalists of our generation, she was also someone who was beloved in the community. I'm she, gonna, I'm gonna to just add one yeah, thing ahead. to that. This is a story that Judy told when she gave the eulogy um, uh, at, uh, at, at, at the service for Gwen. And that was when they first started to co-anchor, they would call each other the night before to ask, what are you gonna wear? Because, you know, if guys wear a blue shirt and a red tie, two guys, I mean, nobody thinks anything of it. What's but, wrong with a blue shirt and a red tie? <laughs> <laughs> but if two women show up in purple or two women show up in red or white, it's gonna, and as Judy told the story after, I don't know how long it was, seven or eight months, they stopped calling because they kind of intuited what the other was gonna wear. So that was really close. We just figured it out. We just had this sort of karma thing going and we didn't have to check, but you're right. I mean, we didn't wanna be the Bobsy twins, you know, with both of us sitting there with the same, with the same color, but uh, anyway. She, she took the job seriously. She never took herself seriously and she had a wicked sense of humor. Wicked. <laughs> Can't repeat some of the Gwen Eiffel. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one, no. Uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, this is for you, Judy. Tell us about your experience on January 6th, 2021. Wow, well, there we were. Uh, all of you remember it so well, there we are. Um, uh, seven, eight months into the pandemic, uh, nine months into the pandemic, I was anchoring the news hour from home, which of course we were all reporting and doing everything we could from home. We just had a handful of people at the news hour who were working in the studio. I was at home, uh, Lisa Desjardins, our Capitol Hill reporter was at the Capitol, inside the Capitol, waiting to report as she likes to say on what would be an ordinary thing, the certification of the, a very C-SPAN moment. A very, thank you, a very C-SPAN moment uh, and a PBS moment yes, uh, where we were covering the certification of the electoral uh, vote, the electoral count. Lisa's in the Capitol, my colleague Amna Navaz uh, and, and then Yamiche Alcindor. Amna was reporting on the what was supposed to be the crowds at the Capitol and Yamiche was the White House, but long story short, what happens? And um, Lisa, I'll never forget, I'm, you know, we are all stunned at what's happening. We had no idea that this crowd, we had reported on the, the rally, the speech uh, of former President Trump, but then to see what happened at the Capitol and it was slowly building and slowly getting worse and worse and worse. And I would periodically go to Lisa who would be in, in a one woman <laughs> photographer, videographer, reporter, carrying her little camera around and showing us what was going on and narrating it as the glass was broken in the Capitol um, and people started breaking through. And then she was trying to interview them as they were running down the hall, holding a microphone out to ask them what, who they were, where they were from, what were they trying to do? Why were they there? And at some point, Capitol policeman or another security person told Lisa she had to get down because these people were armed and for her own safety. And so she was 
hunched down, you know, behind uh, a part of partial wall reporting for the news hour. Whoever thought that we would be in that moment at our United States Capitol with um, people running through the building and trying to get into the chamber, trying to get into the House and Senate chambers. Um, it's a day that, of course, you know, we, we will never forget and, I, and I'll never forget. And Lisa, by the way, um, is, a, is a hero as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure all of you who watch the news hour, she's an extraordinary reporter. Extraordinary reporter day in and day out. She knows more about, has, you know, has established phenomenal contacts with every member of Congress. And she's, you know, covered that day that will live in infamy. Uh, this is for Al Hunt. You said that VPs hardly matter. Our current VP is practically invisible. Why? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think some of that, some of that lies with the president and his, and his staff that have not given her the kind of assignments that would, where she could succeed. Some of it may lie with her. And I think that if Joe Biden is going to run for re-election, I think he's totally convinced he's going to now. I'm not sure that that'll ultimately happen, but you know, you'd have to bet on it. He's got to do something about that because she will become an issue if he runs. He will be 82 years old. And this, people are going to ask a legitimate question if something happens to the president who's going to be 85 and 86 when he's still in the White House, what, what next? And so I think a, a Kamala Harris with a kind of low profile and high negatives because people think she hasn't done anything will be a problem for him. And so they have about a year to start to address that. And I don't know if they're going to, Steve. The chances of Joe Biden running in 2024 are what percent? Well, I guess 60%, but I think it's, I mean, I, um, it worries me. I mean, it really worries me. And I think they're convinced and his staff has convinced him that he's the only one that can win. I don't believe that. Uh, I think a matter of fact, you could make an argument. And by the way, as I said, I think Joe Biden has had a fabulous first two years. He's really been a good president and he's a good person. But uh, if, if someone like Ron DeSantis is the Republican nominee, I think a Gretchen Whitmer or Roy Cooper, uh, you know, would be a much stronger candidate than Joe Biden. It would be kind of, you know, the future against the future. But I think right now, Steve, they, they're doing everything they can. If you had any doubt, you just have to see what they did a week or so ago when they changed the primary system to put South Carolina first, because that's a state where he thinks he is least vulnerable to any kind of a challenge. But you and I both know the first primary is going to be in New Hampshire. If it has to be January 1st of 2024, they're going to have it first, no matter what. Well, or July 4th of 2023. 20, <laughs> By state law, New Hampshire has to be first. By their own state law. Trust me, I've been in New Hampshire. A <laughs> couple of uh, Gwen Eiffel questions for you, Judy. What do you think Gwen would think of the current state of our politics today? And the chemistry between you and Gwen was amazing. Can you recall a fond memory that makes you smile? Oh, there's so many. I would just say, um, what would Gwen think of what's going on today? She'd be flabbergasted. Um, she'd be unhappy. She'd be um, stunned in many ways. I mean, we, 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 she covered American politics. She understood American politics so well, but we hadn't seen, she died six days after the election in 2016. So six days after Donald Trump was elected. So she never lived, she didn't live to see the Trump presidency to see the kind of division that we have in the country right now. I think it would make her very, very sad. In terms of memories, there are so many. I mean, my the thing that would happen over and over again is I would, you know, our offices were next to each other at our, our building in Arlington, Virginia, where the studio is in Washington. I would come in and we'd come in around the same time in the morning. This is back when we were in the office and not remote. Um, and I would be sitting there and, and if she came in, I'd go in her office, but if I, if I come in, I'd be in my, she'd come in and she'd say, all right, what do you know? What do you know? <laughs> and we'd talk about what was going on in the news. And then I have a very bittersweet memory and that is visiting her in the hospital in the last weeks before she passed when she said, I'm gonna be there on election night. I'm gonna be there with you. And of course it wasn't to happen. But um, I'll, I'll always remember that because Gwen was the forever optimist about everything. And so that, that's, that's a memory about her that I'll carry with me always. And now there's a stamp. 
A Gwen Eiffel there stamp. is the Gwen Eiffel stamp. If you can get it at your local United States there Post Office. So, Al, what did you think of the Donald Trump presidency? Uh, in, in 2018, I think it was, uh, there was a right winger on Judy's show named Matt Schlaps. He was the, you know, the kind of the right. And he had a Christmas party and he invited Judy. So naturally I was the walk on. And it was the entire right wing establishment and the Trump people. I mean, the Stephen Millers were all over the place. And I had done a podcast with David Axelrod a day beforehand. And David, when he did his podcast, he would then put out a story on CNN. It was on CNN.com of which the headline was veteran journalist Al Hunt says Trump is the worst president of my lifetime. <laughs> I walked into this party and needless to say, I was not warmly greeted. Um, I, I do. I think the Trump presidency was a disaster. I think it was one can argue about some of the substance. I don't think there was a great deal there. You can like or dislike the tax cut. Uh, I think he probably weakened the alliances, which are terribly important, we can't go it alone. I mean, look at what's happening in Ukraine right now. Biden has put that back together again, but much more than the, 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 the particulars. Uh, he, he really, he, he coarsened the dialogue. There was a, uh, you know, a meanness about it, a, uh, something that went beyond just, uh, uh, you know, political uh, differences or intensity, and it was personal insults. And, uh, it just was really, I think, an ugly period. And I think even I have some very conservative friends who defended some of the substance. And, and I think even by 2020 and certainly by now, they, uh, they, they just are, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're ashamed. I mean, uh, what can you say? Did anybody ever think we would have a former president who brought an anti-Semite and a white nationalist for dinner? I mean, that just, I, I, I'm, I'm appalled. And, and, and I think that, um, and I think that George H.W. Bush was appalled. I think George W. Bush was appalled. I think Mitt Romney was appalled. I'm talking about the Trump behavior. So Tom that's not Ridge a, was appalled. Who? Tom Ridge. Yes, absolutely. Tom Ridge at the. I mean, I. I mean, Tom Ridge ended up endorsing uh, both Hillary Joe Clinton Biden. and yes. Joe Biden. And uh, that's not because all, all of a sudden he became some kind of a socialist. Uh, it was. It was. So I. I know I'm going on too long, but I, I did not have a high regard for the Trump presidency. <laughs> Which really leads to what you're doing with America at a crossroads, trying to find that division. And as you said, we want that fierce debate. That is healthy for our country. But at the end of the day, you also have to come together on some certain principles. And when you have a former president saying it's time to tear up the Constitution, that is frightening. And what I, what I want to do is to hopefully make people feel comfortable enough that whatever their political views are, whether they're on the far left or the far right or anywhere in between, that they feel comfortable enough to talk about why they believe what they do and why they feel so fiercely um, about issues, about certain political figures, and why they think it's so hard for us to come together in Washington and is that the same in their communities? Because again, I think I said this earlier, I'm not convinced we're as divided at the local and in our local communities and with our neighbors as we are, as it seems we are. But, but it is the case that to the extent we're watching cable news, as Al said before, or talk radio, listening to talk radio, that pushes us farther to the right and farther to the left and makes us angry and makes us wanna fight. Um, you know, how healthy is that? I want to look at the role of the news media, the role of social media in all of this. I mean, we're all in this together. And, um, and so I think if we can just shed some kind of light on that, on all of this, maybe it will help us think about what's at stake, you know, in, in, as, as we are trying to be the best American citizens we can be in this democracy that we cherish. And it's reason, it, you know, you need to draw a line. I mean, there is a, a critically important role for a real debate, for real differences. I mean, for most of the time that I covered 
presidential politics, congressional politics, a, a real disagreement over tax cuts, a real disagreement over the war in Iraq, a real disagreement on social spending, a real disagreement on abortion. Those are very legitimate issues that ought to be discussed and debated. Whether an election was honest or not is not a legitimate debate. Whether an election was stolen or not is not a legitimate debate. Whether it was okay to assault the capital of the United States of America to stop a, 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 a validation of a presidential election is not a legitimate debate. And, and I think those who say, well, we've always had differences. Yes, we have, but they're not like what has occurred recently, Steve. And what I would add just quickly, Steve, is I think you know somebody pointed out to me yesterday um, that um, yes, we've had terrible division in the country before. We, we had the Civil War. We had the terrible McCarthy era uh, with uh, you know, red baiting and the rest of it. We've been through the Vietnam War, but I don't know of a time, and I'll be interested to see if somebody can prove to me that I'm wrong about this, when it was so personal. I feel the political has become the personal now and, and vice versa. And I wanna to try to understand why that is. Why are we in a period where we think that somebody who disagrees with us about politics, about international affairs, about immigration, about education is our enemy and that they aren't patriotic. They aren't good Americans if they think the way they do. That's what I wanna to try to understand. You've been so gracious with your time. I have a couple of lightning round questions, but I'm gonna give you advance warning. The final question, you have been to countless dinner parties and gatherings, and you probably each have a favorite story. So I want you to think about that, both of you, in just a moment. Uh, Judy, this is for you. What do you think the future of news broadcasting is? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's complicated. Um, um, broadcast, if you say specifically broadcasting, it's already changed so much because the, uh, the network news that we grew with, that I grew up with watching Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley, um, it's still there. There's still great journalists doing that. But of course, what do we have today? We have cable news on television. We have digital. Everybody's getting their news from their devices. Certainly the younger generation is, they're, they're watching some of these programs, but they're watching them in bits and pieces on YouTube and they're watching them in their own time on their devices. That's the future. Uh, so I think there will always be a need for news, for news coverage. I have no doubt about that in a democracy. We can't have a democracy unless we're informed, but I think it's going to look very, very different as technology forges ahead. Al Hunt, the loss of the fairness doctrine and the influence of Newt Gingrich on American politics. Your thoughts? I think both were mistakes. <laughs> both. Uh, I mean, Gingrich was a fabulous guerrilla warrior. I don't know that the Republicans could have taken back the House without Gingrich. He really was. He just knew exactly how to fight. It was really mean, but it was really effective. And then, then he had no idea how to govern because he was a, he, you know, if you're a guerrilla warrior, you're not likely to be a good governor. And uh, so I, I think the influence was bad. Um, I, I, I would just, if I can steal from Judy's, the question was about broadcast. Uh, talk about newspapers for a second. I have no worries generally about newspapers or print news or whatever we call it on the national level. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they both have good, they all have good business models. Uh, they all have as good reporting as they've ever had. I wish a lot of them would stay up Twitter, but they really are doing some great journalism. I worry a great deal about journalism at the local level. I worry, and you all see it here in Erie. Uh, when you are not controlled by local people, when you have you know, these big places that don't really care about local communities, when you have a bad business model, uh, I don't know the particulars of your Erie paper, but I know the Chicago Tribune 15 years ago had 650 reporters. Today, they have 120. You can't cover the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois with 120 reporters. And I, I, I really don't see much basis for optimism. There are a couple places, nonprofits and others that will fill the void, but they can't fill the whole void. We have some veteran journalists, Meg Loncherik, who spent 40 years at the Erie Times News. And of course, that paper today is quite different now that it is not locally owned by the Mead family. There's a Gallup survey. I'm going to build on this question, Judy, that uh, in Nevada, Arizona, New Hampshire, there are more independents than Democrats and Republicans. And so this question is the rise of non-affiliated voters in our politics. 
aka independence. And we're seeing much more of that. And we saw, of course, Kirsten Cinema, who is now an independent. And, and, and who said that she was uh, doing that because she didn't feel she had a home in either party. And of course, some people were saying, well, there was a political motive to it, but she is now the third self-identified independent in the, in the United States Senate. I don't know enough about politics to be able to forecast for you where we're going with that, but clearly there is a lot of unhappiness in the country right now with what's happened to our political parties in that they are so divided, they can't seem to work together. And I know many Americans point at one party or another and say they're more to blame, the D's are more to blame, no, the R's are more to blame. And I see that. Um, but I, um, do I think that can't not be healed? I'm not ready to write it off. Um, it, it, you know, for all of its flaws, it's a system that's gotten us where we are today. And you can say, well, that's, <laughs> that's a good reason to, to shake it all up, but you can't shake it all up very easily. I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled, you know, you can raise as much money as you want to raise. Um, the political party caucuses, uh, control so much of what members of Congress can do. The money, the money, the money. Um, there's, they're just, and the gerrymandering, which you raised in your first question. There's so many, there's so many aspects of our political structure right now that it's hard for me to see how we move away from the D and the R uh, formula. In the Georgia Senate race in 2020 and 2022, just in the Senate race, $1.4 billion. Think about that. One race, two cycles. This is addressed to Judy, but I'm going to ask this for you, Al. Now that uh, you and Trevor Noah are retiring, will the two of you be on the road together? Al, what do you think of that? In our, in our household, there is only one dirty word. It's called retirement. Uh, and no one's retiring. Uh, Judy in particular will not retire. I think she's going to be busier than ever and it's going to be more exciting. I hope she'll let me come with her sometimes. It's still an open question. Uh, and I go and I left full-time journalism, at, or full-time at the Wall Street Journal and then at Bloomberg. And, and now I'm, 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 doing, I'm still doing a column for a place called The Hill, which kind of keeps me active. I'm doing a, I have great fun doing a weekly podcast with James Carville. I mean, if you think if you think anything is a treat, spend an hour or so every week with James Carville, and then I teach at the how University. How do you Princeton. censor that though? Oh, it's well. That's the thing, great thing about a podcast. You don't have to censor. There you go. Yeah. And uh, so, in any event, there's going to be no retirement in the Woodruff Hunt household. So get those stories ready. But this is the final question, and I love this. Whoever asked it, thank you, Judy. We respect and we love you, and I approve that message. Please, please, please say it again the acceptance speech from your recent award, you are admired, press forward, thank you. Well, thank you very much. What a generous comment that is, whoever it came from. I you just- have how many Emmys? <laughs> well, this one, it was, I was particularly lifetime achievement. I, you know, I was blown away by that. Um, I think the, the line you may be referring to is, is that I said for all the difficult um, political circumstances going on in our country right now, the division, the fact that our business model has collapsed, that newspapers have disappeared, as Al has described, local media is struggling mightily everywhere. We are so opinionated, we're swimming in a sea of opinion. Despite all that, I said, we in journalism have to get up every morning and put on our boots or our high heels and just keep going day after day after day. What the country needs are facts, what the country needs is reporting. What the country needs is evidence. Uh, we've got plenty of opinion out there. We don't, in my view, we don't need any more opinion than we've got. Yes, we welcome it in a democracy, but journalism will stay strong because journalists are reporting and reporting and reporting. And that's what we need to do day after day after day. And that's what keeps us strong as a country. Amen. Don't tell us what you think, tell us what you know. So before we hear those final cocktail party stories, if you have one, hopefully you do, I wanna thank President Keith Taylor. Where is President Taylor? If you could stand up, are you still here? President Taylor and to Gannon University Theories over there, thank you. Gannon has been a tremendous partner in this effort and we couldn't do it without you. Congratulations, you have six more months and you're not retiring either. So. 
Hopefully you're taking a cue from them and to Dr. Perky Ferrari, please stand up. He is the vision behind all of this, the president of the Jefferson. And I wanna thank all of you for coming out on a glorious, fabulous, eerie night. <laughs> you had a chance to see Erie and I hope you come back because this is a great and proving your, ground. Your beautiful Christmas decorations, yes. the beautiful Just for trees, you. the lights, yeah. wonderful. I mean, here and out in the park and just It's gorgeous. a beautiful city and it is thriving and growing as you saw all the renovation and it's, uh, it's really a work in progress and we're all proud of our hometown. So here's to Erie PA. Okay, so with that, um, Judy, I'll start. Oh, go ahead. I don't have a great party but a story. I'm going to turn it over to Al because Al, I remember when we were just when we were just married. This was back in the time when you could invite Democrats and Republicans over, and they would have a great conversation. They would disagree. Danny Rostenkowski, tell one of those stories where they would discuss and argue late into the night. A lot of uh, shall we say alcohol was consumed. <laughs> we were a lot younger, um, but it was a it was a time when when everybody had a great time, and then they would go their separate ways, and they were friends. Democrats and Republicans were friends. They would argue across the dinner table about this or that, but they were hug at the end of the evening. Yeah, they were great. They were, but I'm going to tell my favorite Washington <laughs> dinner party. Story. There's not even a close second. This is one through 10. The great Vernon Jordan had a dinner party for Kofi Annan, the UN ambassador. And that evening, I happened to be seated between John Warner, Senator John Water, Warner, the patrician Republican Senator from Virginia, and Charlie Rangel, the black Congressman from Harlem. And they actually were, were friends. They both were Marine Corps veterans of the Korean War and they really liked each other a lot. And in the middle of this dinner, Charlie Rangel, I'm in the middle, leans over. And of course, you remember that John Warner had been married to Elizabeth Taylor. And Charlie Rangel leans over and said, John, there's a question I've always wanted to ask you. And John Warner said, what is it, Charlie, my man? And he says, when you're doing it with an actress, how do you know she's liking it and not just acting? I almost dropped off the chair and John, John Warner looked at him and said, Charlie, that was the problem. <laughs> so you can't top that for a dinner party conversation in Washington. <laughs> I'm speechless. Thank you very much. We love Erie. Judy, Al, thank you.